on any given Sunday, any given Sunday, during football season, three teams take the field. Three teams take the field at every game. There is the home team, of course. There is the visiting team. But I want to talk about that third team for a minute, the team of officials. The team of officials, this third team, they are on the field, but they're not of the field. They are in the middle of a war zone. They're in the middle of a conflict. Two teams that can't get along, two teams that are going in two opposite directions. They have two different goals in mind. But smack dab in the middle of this team, these teams, is this team. This team belongs to the league. They are under the authority of the commissioner, and their job is to represent the interests of the field, or of the league, on the field of play. Their job is to bring the bear on the game field, the guidelines of Park Avenue. Up north, guidelines have been developed to govern what happens on every field in the NFL. There is a book. This book establishes what the governance is to govern the war zone on the field. Those officials are not allowed to take sides. In fact, if they take sides, Independently of the book, they have illegitimized their presence on the field. In fact, they break fellowship with the commissioner when the book no longer governs the decisions. If they listen to the crowd or the argumentation of the players and let that affect their choices, decisions, they have become illegitimate referees. There is a kingdom Jesus Christ is king over this kingdom, and he has established in history a third team. And a whole lot of teams in history. There's black team and white team, a Republican team and a Democratic team. There's maybe an upper class team and a lower class team, but in the middle of that, those teams, well, there's a team of officials. People whose allegiance is not to what's happening on the field, but to the league office and the commissioner who have placed them there. The tragedy today is that too many of God's people have joined teams on the field and therefore illegitimized themselves with the commissioner where he no longer can relate to his specific team on the field who's supposed to be representing his interest amidst the conflict of history because they've become too attached to what's happening around them. Jesus Christ called a meeting. It is the only meeting he called after he rose from the dead. He only scheduled one meeting. He had a number of meetings, but only one was scheduled. There are five commissions in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, but the one in Matthew is different because it uses a word that none of the others use. It's the word mathetes, which means disciple. He calls a meeting. Three groups attend the meeting. Verse 16 of Matthew 28 says, the 11 disciples attend the meeting. 1 Corinthians 28 says, 500 brethren attended the meeting. The 11 are part of the 500, so that nets us 489 who come to the meeting. About this size crowd comes to the meeting. Now, that is a third group that attends the meeting because Jesus says at the end of Matthew 28, and lo, I will be with you even until the end of the age. Well, the age has not ended, so you and I are at the meeting. So why don't we mosey on up the hill and see what they're meeting about and find out what this third team is all about. Jesus Christ gathers them together, the 489 who are physically there and then everyone who would come after them, and then he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Translation, gentlemen, I'm in charge now. All authority has been given to me. Now, that word authority is very interesting because there are a number of Greek words for authority. The one that most people know is dunamis, where we get our English word dynamite from. But that's not the word. Dynamite, dunamis, that's explosive power. That's not the word he uses here. He says, all ekousia belongs to me. Now, the Greek word ekousia means uh, legitimate use of power. Dunamis is just being big and strong and powerful. Ekousia means the right to use it. 
He says, I'm in charge now, and I am the only legitimate source of authority. Any authority that contradicts me is illegitimate authority because all authority, that is all legitimate right to use authority. I mean, there's some big guys here. You're bigger than every official on the field. You're faster than every official on the field. You are, 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 are stronger than every official on the field. Well, you might be able to knock him down, but he can put you out because he has a goose here and you may have dunamis. He can pull in his pocket, pull out a yellow flag, and he can stop play. He can do that. Because while he does not have your power, he has the commissioner's authority. When he says all authority belongs to me, Jesus Christ is saying, I am the only legitimate, I am the commissioner. I am the one who has the final say-so in history and all authority belongs to me. Satan, our arch enemy spiritually, has power. He didn't lose power. What he lost was authority. So he is stronger than you, but he does not have more authority than you. But if you're disconnected from the commissioner, you will get knocked down on the field because the commissioner exercises authority. If you're not under authority, then you're subject to foreign power. All authority belongs to me in heaven, up there, and on earth down here, in eternity and in time in heaven and in history. So we're not just talking about the, uh, the glorious by and by. Jesus says we're talking about the nasty here and now. All authority belongs to me in heaven and on earth. And gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, what Jesus says on that mountain to the 489 and to the 490 who are 19 who have gathered here is I'm in charge now. I'm setting the agenda. I'm establishing how this thing is supposed to work. And then he gives the commission. I notice that's one of your goals this weekend. He says, all authority belongs to me in heaven and on earth. And what I want you to do is make disciples. I don't just want you to make Christians. You can become a Christian without being a disciple. You can come into the stadium and not be a player on the field. He says, I want you to make disciples. Now this word, mathetes, the Greek word for disciple, was a very interesting word. It was a word which meant to create a follower who emulated the one he was following. Discipleship may be defined as progressively bringing all of life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Discipleship may be defined as progressively bringing all of life under the tutelage, under the authority, under the dominion of Jesus Christ. Far too many Christians, maybe even most Christians, have a visitation relationship with Christ, not a dominion one. Jesus says, I'm, a, I'm in charge now, and what I want you to do is I want you to create a generation of men and women who don't just accept me for heaven, but allow me to be Lord over them for earth. I want you to create a group of people who walk out of step because they march to a different drumbeat. Now, this word mathetes is very interesting because it was used in Greek uh, language going all the way back to Plato. Plato had a philosophy, Platonic thought. He separated the spiritual world from the world of matter. Matter was bad, spirit was good. And he began to train people in the system of thought. You and I know it today as sacred and secular, the division of between the sacred and the secular. Well, that's basically the contemporary way of stating a Platonic thought. Well, a young man studied Platonic thought. His name was Aristotle. Aristotle took Plato's thinking, organized it, arranged it, and systematized it into a worldview and framework of how you live life. We call it Aristotelian logic. So Platonic thought got systematized by Aristotle. Aristotle built academies or schools. These schools were designed to teach young men and women how to think platonically through a system of Aristotelian logic so that they would exercise whatever discipline they were in in accordance to that worldview. So they began to think in a platonic worldview, systematized through Aristotle, so that when they went out into their discipline, they reflected that thinking. Well, Greece was overcome by Rome. Rome defeated Greece, but Rome ran into a problem. Because even though Rome was in charge militarily, Greece was in charge culturally. We call it the Hellenization of Rome.